so <laughs> this is really bad. So I did 30 minutes of recording with the microphone on mute and didn't realize until I finished recording that it was on mute. So now I have to dub over what I've recorded. So uh, this is the second attempt at recording this video. I did it yesterday and then I discarded it. So I didn't want to discard it again today because I wouldn't have time to re record it and post it. So this is going to be the dub version of the video. So if you see it some places, the audio seem a little bit out of sync. That's because I'm actually watching the video and trying to talk over it, trying to remember what I said before. So sorry about that. Um, try and remember next time to um, try and make sure that it's in sync. Part of the reason is that I have a new microphone. I don't know if you can tell the difference from the audio, but I do have a microphone, new microphone that's supposed to be better. Some people said that the audio was a little bit um, weird. So I got a new microphone, but now it has its external mute and uh, yeah. All right, sorry about that. So anyway, let's get into it. Welcome back, thanks for joining. And today we're gonna look at how you're gonna wait for Go Routines. In the previous video, uh, previous section, what we did was we looked at how do you tell a Go Routine to clean up and shut down without killing it, you know, um, just exit it and not giving it an opportunity to possibly clean up at work. But that is still some other part of your program mm -hmm. determining that, well, hey, we finished, thanks for all your service, go routines, but now it's time to, to, to terminate. And you're giving them an opportunity to clean up, maybe close out some files, write some last data, whatever it is, right? Re, um, release uh, resources they have allocated and so on. And that was great. Now we're gonna say, well, we have some go routine and we don't know how long they're gonna take. We launch them to do some work and now we wanna wait until they have completed. So we're talking about here in this section about how do you wait for go routine and have the go routines be able to signal to main or some other part of your program that they are finished. And so if you look at this diagram here, imagine a main launch some go routines, A through F. And what main is really interested in doing is not exiting before any all the go routines have completed their work. So we can see that if um, C finish first, followed by um, A and then D and then B, and then F, and then finally E finished last. But what you want is the go routine not to exit until after the very last go routine finish, right? Because remember that our once main exit, all our go routine goes away. So that is what we're gonna see how to do here. And it does look like if the go routines are communicating back to main, and in a way they are. Now we can, we can see example where we do this directly or explicitly where we have the go routine signal back to main that, oh, I'm finished. And then we're gonna see a way of using the weight group um, data structure provided in the sync um, standard package from the Go language, how to do that sort of more cleanly. All right, so let's take a look. So just as before, we copy previous um, di um, di example directory and we start up our editor and we're gonna go from there. And so, one of the first thing I want to do is sort of just remind us of how we used to do things before, where we would have um, a go routine, um, launch a number of go routine, sort of wait until they're completed, and then we'll um, then end our program. So instead of having this quit channel, for example, um, we wouldn't have that. We'll get rid of um, the go routine returning any sort of channel. And we'll just say that uh, let's launch some go routine, and maybe we still have quit channel, or maybe we don't. If it's the thing we're doing is in the first example where we launch the go routine and then have wait for a little bit and then we exit, this would be the case for that, right? Um, launch some go routine, hope that they finish when after two seconds, and then we exit, right? Of course, we don't need this, right? So that's how we used to do things before. Now, afterward, we said, oh, oh that was kind of mean. You know, we don't know if the go routine still wanted to talk or whatever. And so we went to um, giving them a channel. So um, let's undo a little bit of this code. And we're not going to spend too much time on it because this was exactly in the previous video. Um, so we don't need this part where we sit around and wait. But we do want to say, what if we were to pass to the go routine um, a channel 
on which they can tell us when they're done. So we can call it, let's say, the done channel. So instead of us sending a message to them telling them, oh, it's time to quit or complete, we're going to use this channel for them to tell us that oh, they're done. And again, it doesn't really matter what value we use. And so now we really don't have to sit around and collect a channel back from them because we don't care what they're actually working on, but no, they're going to accept a done channel and they don't create a channel and return it. So we can get rid of these two lines. And um, here we're going to say, well, they're not going to launch a goal routine because we're launching a goal routine from main and self. And so these are just chatters. And so we want them to talk for a little bit. So oh, how can we do that? Let's um, get a random number and say that they're going to talk for some random number of time. And so we can call this talk time and we can get ran that int n. And then we said maybe 3000 um, milliseconds or nanoseconds. We'll figure that out later. Um, the other thing we want to do is to uh, see the random number generator. So let's make sure we see it with the current time and then Unix time, of course, to get an in 64 bit value for, um, for seeding a random number generator. So that seems to be okay. Now that we have some random time that um, these chatters can talk, now we actually want to create a timeout. So we're gonna say time up, which is like a timeout for our chatters to talk. So this is how much time they're gonna talk. And so if you remember when we call time that after it returns us a channel on which we can wait for the time to expire. And so that's exactly what we're going to do. And for now, we're going to use, um, let's go with nanoseconds. All right. Um, now, what do we need to do? Well, we need to change our, um, what we're doing here. So we're in an infinite loop and we're going to select and what we're going to do is we're going to try and um, read from our done channel, right? Or time up, sorry. So we're going to see if it's time's up and if it's up, then we know it's always time to clean up. And so we say we can say we're quitting after talking for a certain amount of time. So we can put it in our print line function there. We can add, um, you know, quitting after time, that duration, however long we spoke, right? All right, so so that's that's good. Um, after we finish here, we want a break. Well, we're gonna see that there's a bug here, but we're gonna look at that later and I'll show you exactly what the bug is and how to fix it. But if we can read from the time, so if time is not up, what we wanna do is just keep talking. So we're just gonna do FMT, that the, the name of our talker. So our talker is gonna talk, all right? And so that should be it, except that we have um, a little bit of an issue here with our code and it's there on line 29 where I need a parentheses. Um, I actually didn't type out nanoseconds, so I need nanoseconds and then um, parentheses to close it out. So let's type that in, da da da, close parentheses. Okay, so this should be good now. And so let's try and run this code now. Oh, we don't need to be reading from quit or sending rather um, sending any value to our quit channel. Instead, if we start up some talkers and after they've completed, they're gonna let us know that they've quit. So they're gonna send on the done channel um, a value saying, hey, I'm, I'm finished, okay? And so now we just in main here have to wait and make sure that we get a message from each one of the chatters, right? So all we need to do is say, let me try and read from the done channel here. And if you imagine that if we were to just leave it here alone, then of course we would wait on one of our go routine finishing and then the second one and then the third one. Um, of course, we're gonna end the program if we just stop here, so it wouldn't matter. But the whole point here is to say that we wanna make sure that all of our Go routine, we wait until all of our Go routines completed. So if we have four chatters, then we definitely wanna um, wait around and try to read four messages to make sure that all four of them sent us a message. So we definitely need to add another um, line here to try and read from this channel. So this seems to be okay. Of course, there's that bug that I told you about, the very subtle bug. And so once we finish reading from all four of them, we know that we can print out that all of our chatters, you know, finish talking um, at this point. And then oh, we can certainly end the program. So let's try and go run this and see what happens. All right. So oh, uh, there's a problem here. Also, we 
are having a, the wrong type of channel. So we're just saying that there is a channel we could send a value on, even though that's not terribly important, but okay. So let's go now and run this code and see what happens. And I'm telling you that oh, there's still a bug here, a very subtle bug, but we'll see that in a minute. And so let's run the code. All right. Um, again, sorry, I'm after to talk over the video that I previously recorded and did not record the audio. So I'm probably a little bit ahead of where I'm actually was saying. But anyway, so running the code now and you could see it looked like if it worked. But the, like I said, there's a bug here. Even though I said all chatter is finished, you could still see um, some results printed out. So it's not quite working like we expect. And to see why is really in this for loop here. And so when we do break, we're actually breaking out of the select statement and not of the for loop. And we can demonstrate that by having this main function hang around for a little bit longer and by sleeping. Now, if all my go routines are completed, as I said, they should be because they all send four messages. Um, each one sends sorry, a message, so I have four messages. Then if I wait one for a second, I shouldn't see any more messages um, from my go from my chatters, right? Because they finished talking. But that's not what you're gonna see here when I run this. And you can see they're still talking, right? Um, we know that how they send message saying that how they finish talking. So this break actually break out of the select statement, but because that's in a for loop, um, it continued going around. So um, I'm gonna cut the video here because what I was trying to show in the original recording is that. Um, I'm going to change this to run it for milliseconds to show that how, um, yes, you're going to see all the chatterers send a message that, you know, they've um, completed, um, but I still can't see it on the screen, so I'm going to go to like nanoseconds um, to be able to see it, but you get the point that obviously this is not working, um, and so if I take out the timing for waiting, um, you're going you're gonna to see it, right, that this says all chatter finished, but still I get to talk, so obviously this this code is now working like it's supposed to, to work, right? And they are all the chatterers saying that, oh, they have completed, yet they can, they're still talking when I give more time to my main. So we don't really need to do a break here. We need to do a return because the break is breaking out of the select. It's not breaking out of the for loop. But if we do a return, that ensures that oh, we return from this function. So the function, this function terminate, hence the go routine terminate, right? And once the function ends, the go routine that was created to manage it also go, goes away. So we just do a return here. If we type return, and everything is going to work as we expect now. So I don't even need to sleep. But if I sleep more, you're going to see it though. No other messages are going to be printed out on the screen, um, no matter how long more I sleep. And so let's run it now and see the difference. Yeah, come on. I don't know what else I was talking about, but by now I should be over on the console to say, let's run, run it and see it. Ah, oh, this is terrible. All right. So there we go. Um, so run it and there you see, I'm waiting. I'll go routine quit and I waited and nobody was talking. Right. So that proved that that fixed that subtle bug. So that's very important. So keep that in mind that you want to make sure that all you end exit your go routine if you intend for them to quit and now what we did before when we did a break we just sort of break the select statement but of course in a for loop we go back around there was nothing to read from time up because there's no value ever going to come again and so we were stuck on default every time and so well, we keep chatting all right all right so that's one way of doing things now our coder is a little bit error prone because you can imagine that someone could come around and either remove the number of chatterers or added more chatterers. And um, if we don't add, compensate our reading from the channels to make sure that this works, then of course this isn't be a problem. So if we have three go routine and we're waiting for a fourth message, it's not going to be a fourth chatterer to send that fourth message. So of course we're going to crash then, right? Um, we're going to deadlock. Um, but also the person could add more go routine. And we don't wait long enough. And so those new go routine won't have that opportunity to tell us that they are complete. Once we read from four that said they're complete, the first four which completes, then the new ones will just be killed off. So I'm going to skip ahead here, cut the video and skip ahead to where 
I get into working with weight groups. And I'll explain exactly how we go about doing that before we get into weight groups. So here's the documentation on weight groups. And it says that oh, um, the sync package provides, you know, basic synchronization primitives and so on. And of course, weight group. And so that's what the one we're going to be working on. But before I go into weight groups, I want to go back a little bit and revisit something that we talked about before. A weight group is not a value, it's actually a variable. So you want to say create variable, weight group, and from the sync packet, that weight group. And you want to think of this like a structure. Um, this is a type, right? And so it's not an expression. It's like creating like a variable for integer or something. It has a value. And the reason why this is important is because of the potential bug that you're going to see us introduce if we don't understand that oh, this is a variable and how to use it and pass it around. So let me revisit something that we've done before. So I'm going to create a structure of type person, right? And we did this when we talk about structure. So struct type person is a structure and I'm going to put a name string and uh, int age integer in this um, struct. Now I'm going to go create a variable of type person. So I'm going to say var p is a person. No, p is not pointer to a person. It is a person, which means it has um, the fields name and age that you can assign to. And we can print out by doing printf percent v and of course um, let's do a new line and then print out p and if we go run this code we're going to see that oh we have a empty struct which is what we expect and of course since we're using a variable of age is of type int we can see zero for age now we could go back and add the uh, field names by using pong you know the pong um pong symbol and that would give us the name of um of the fields and, and their value when we print it out. Um, and so um, I need percent pong, not, um, not just pong v, but percent pong, all right? And so if I run this now, um, I'm going to get um, the field name. And so you could see that person has name is an empty string and age is dot zero that we're seeing, right? So again, in Go, your types are going to have their value set to their default value that's appropriate for that type. Now, why is this important? Well, let's create a function here called change name. And the intent of this function is to change the name of a person. And so it's, of course, it's going to take a person. And since we want to change a name, we're going to say p that name um, is equal to something. And um, Bob is fine. And now let's go back up here and print out, um, call this function and print out what happens after we call change name when we pass p in and so let's call change name we're going to pass p in that should change the name to p and then we print out um, p and what we would expect is to first not see a value for name then we call change name and then we print it out so now we should expect to see bob but that's not what happens and the reason why notice how um, the p still is unchanged and the reason why is because when we call um, change name here and we pass P we are passing a copy of the value okay and so remember all function calls are copied by value and so we it's copying all the fields and pass it into change name now if instead of change name we printed it out then yeah we would see P that name the person have a new name but outside there are two different values the one inside of main and the one side of change name what we need to do is pass a pointer to that point person. And so we do that by putting an ampersand. And then, of course, change name. Now we have to accept a pointer to person. So it, it's star. And now when we run it, we get the exact um, behavior we expect. Now, you might not think this has anything to do with a rate group, but it does. And I'm going to show you that a little bit later. So let's erase this and let's go back to, um, you know, creating our... Um, chatter so that it can use a weight group and let's see how we can use a weight group but the important thing here is a weight group is just like um, this type and um, just like how you treat person there you want to make sure that if you're passing it to functions that's going to change it you want to make sure you pass a pointer and not just a copy of it and we're going to see that in a bit here so I'm going to pretend that oh, I'm going to launch some chatters 
and instead of passing a done channel, I don't have a done channel to pass. Instead, I'm going to be passing um, this weight group. So um, let's let's do just that. Um, I'm going to back up and just use the select at the selection with multiple um, cursors, and I'm just change four lines at once. And so here we don't accept a done channel. Instead, we accept a weight group. But notice how I'm typing my weight group. What I said before with person, this is gonna pass a copy of it, right? And instead of here of sending done on a channel, I just invoke the weight group that done method. So here's the first time we're probably actually using types with methods, okay? And so this weight group, we can attach methods to our types. We have person, but you don't see us attach any method to person like print or anything or get name or any of that sort of stuff, but we're gonna learn that in a few chapters. All right. So now that we've oh, all of our channels are our chatters can tell us when we're done. The thing we have to do is now wait some arbitrary, arbitrary, arbitrary time, arbitrary time, but rather just say weight group that weight. And the weight group is going to take care of all that logic for us and say, okay, um, I need to wait on all these channels and only when um, these go routine and only when they've completed because they're going to say signal that they're finished that I know it's always safe to move to go ahead. But how does the weight group know how many um, go routine it should wait for? Well, this is where we call the weight group that add. And so we can, it's a, it takes an integer, and we could call weight group that add one before we spin off each go routine. And by doing that, we, if you know semaphores, um, basically what we're saying is, hey, we have increased the count here on the weight group for each go routine we've kicked off. And of course, once the go routines come set that they're complete, it decrements that number. And so if you have a weight group and you, for example, um, change the order and put the go routine first and then call the weight group, um, things may not work as you expect. So definitely make sure that oh, you call the add function first before you kick off that go routine. And in the go routine, when it finishes work, it should do um, call the done. And so now when we get here to W.G2927, we know it all, um, if we pass this line that all our go routine that we have launched have completed. And so then we can print out our message and so on. So let's run this and let's see how this works. So this is better than what we had before because we don't really have to do all the logic of maintaining a channel or something. And we see even a better way of do, using this weight group in just a minute here. But let's just run this and see that this work first. So. All right, uh, should be running now. <laughs> okay. Um, all right, let's wait here because I don't know what I'm doing, saying, still saying in the video, in the original recording, but um, if I don't get to running it here soon, I'm going to cut the video and skip to the part with running. All right, so there we go, finally. Oh boy, this guy talks a lot. So, of course, um, this fails. Now, why did this fail? Well, it's because of that bug that I told you about. When we call our chatterers, we give them a copy of the weight group. And so the weight group is one here, and then we pass a copy to chatter Bob. So he gets a weight group with a value one. So when you call done, that weight group that he get the copy here is at zero. Then we added one to that same weight group and then pass it to chatter Joe. So Joe gets a weight group with two. So when he called done, his weight group is still at one. And so by the time you get to the fourth one, he gets the weight group with four. And of course, when you call done on that one weight group, the weight group copy that he has with four, you know, that weight group still has value in it. So when we try to wait, we're at line 24 waiting on a, um, we have a weight group with four, uh, but we only have Mary who is going to decrement that weight group to, by one. And so the go run time notices that, hey, after Mary and all these other guys exited, um, I have one go routine left, which is the main, and this weight group is still at three, or not zero, and so there's nobody left to decrement it, so that's why it knows that it's deadlock. So if we pass a pointer instead in to a weight group, now notice how this works very well, because each one of them is getting a pointer to the exact same weight group, so as I increment on, they decrement, they're incrementing and decrementing the same weight group, and notice how immediately that error goes away. So hence why I spent some time covering the whole thing about person just to make drive this point home of why you need to pass a pointer wrong 
for the weight group. And notice if we had another chatterer like Jane, it also works very well, just so long as we make sure that we also um, increase or um, do an add one for any other goal routine we had. Now, I said before that oh, somebody could come and add a new chatter and could make things bad. Like for example, somebody could come and add a chatter mic, but then add one on a weight group. And so this code would still be kind of bad in that, yes, it would still terminate. We'd only wait for four, but we still have the problem we had before where you know we didn't wait for enough of a goal routine. So since this takes an integer, and I know that, oh, I have six um, goal routine here, I could just say add six and then spin up six goal routine. Right? And it's still going to work fine and correctly if I make sure that oh, the number I add um, is equal to the number of goal routine that I spin up. Whether I do one at a time or I do six and then spin up six goal routine. But I still think this is error prone. So I'm going to take out launching the goal routine from here. And I'm going to take out Colin hat from here. And instead, since we're passing a pointer to the weight group anyway, I'm going to go in here and I'm going to say, why don't we just call one in the chatter, what we call chatter, why don't we do the weight group that add one here because we know we're going to be launching a go routine and then launch a go routine from, from here. And so now our code is a little bit more robust. So the work that we're supposed to be doing, we put it inside of go routine. And because of go closure and everything, we know that our, um, our go routine, which is the function from line 32 to uh, 44 has access to all the variable variables inside of the chatter function. And of course, this have to be a function when we um, give it to the go function, right? Um, a function call. So now we know it all, um, this function from 32 um, down to 40 something has access to that same weight group. And so now if we add another talker like Peter, for example, we don't have to worry about introducing a bug because Simply adding Peter, well, all the fact of adding one to the weight group and calling done is all wrapped away inside of this chatter. And so everything is going to work fine. And there is our weight that done is inside of the goal routine um, that we have from um, 32 to 45, 45. Okay. So now if we run this, this should work perfectly fine because um, everything the go routine needs is available inside of the variables are all inside one place. Now you can, if you wanted to pass a variable to the go routine itself, and all you have done is introduce into the go routine um, between lines 33 and 45, its own private, per private variable. And there's a reason that you might want to do something like that. We'll see that in a couple of section later on towards the end of this um, chapter when you might want to pass in a value. And so we see now that our stuff runs the exact same way and we're waiting for all our go routines to complete before we end. Okay, so that's pretty much it. I hope you understand. I know this was a little bit difficult because the audio, the video is not quite in sync, but I tried to hopefully put them a little bit in sync. The original audio with the video would have made the video much longer because you could see as I redubbed it, I was a little bit ahead. Um, all I'm showing here now is that instead of doing the weight that done at line 39 inside the go, you're still doing it inside the go routine because the go routine have to be the one that says that I'm complete. So um, you have to do it inside the go routine. What I can do is say, if this go, when this go routine exits, I want to call defer. If you remember in chapter two, we talked about go having this defer function. And so one of the first thing I do when I go into go routine is say defer the call to wait that done. So I know I have to do this regardless of how this go routine exit. And the advantage to doing this is that now if you have multiple cases that result in you returning from that go routine, like if you had another case and you want to return from it, you don't have to worry that each one of those cases you have to call with group that done or somebody else might come and add a new case and they wouldn't call it. So this is much, much more robust code to say defer the weight that done. And again, it's still going to work the exact same way because now you're saying when that function ends, regardless of how it ends, which one of those cases it ends, I've already arranged for the go run time to, go run time to call my w that weight group that done 
uh, regards to how this goal routine is going to think. Notice where the weight defer is. It's inside of the goal routine. It's not outside. Anyway, back to what I was saying before. Um, so I think this is enough. It's sort of a long video. I'm going to sort of end it here. Thanks for your time. Um, if you have questions, definitely look at the documentation for the sync package. Um, look online for examples of using, um, you know, weight group and look for the YouTube videos and definitely post questions or comments on this channel and then I can try to address it. Okay, take care and see you in the next video. Bye.